This is where the fun begins. I had fought the worst of all wars and witnessed the redemption of evil. I have seen balance restored to the Force. But order can turn to chaos, as it did when I was born. Now, with my loved ones and my loyal allies, I face a new challenge unlike any before. And I'm not sure if this time we can win. Star Wars Vector Prime by R.A. Salvatore, the first novel of the new Jedi Order. Hello, hello, and welcome everyone for the special occasion coffee chat on Monday morning. And I do have a guest here. I have Tuscan and Bob. Thank you for jumping in. And I see I have a chat that's waiting. And one of the most important questions is what are your what is your beverage? What's in your mug? What are you enjoying today? I don't have my camera on. I've been busy all morning, so I'm not even presentable right now. But in my mug, I have coffee and I'm drinking out of my twin son's um, squadron mug as well. And there's been some important, some really crazy development going on this morning with Michael Stackpole. And if you haven't watched my video from yesterday about maybe a hint or does Stackpole really know if Cornhorn is going to be used in the new lore? Um, so go ahead and check out that video, but we're going to recap on that today. But first of all, how are you doing, Greg? I am doing good. I had a great weekend. I ate too much. I drank too much. I got too much sun. <laughs> it's good times. Good times. And so how are you feeling physically then? Are you coping right now with the, with feeling that? I'm still a goddamn lobster. I, ugh. <laughs> I <laughs> spent way too much time outside on Saturday and uh, did not properly uh, protect myself. So I am mm -hmm. paying that price. I'm uh, still okay. very, very red. And I got the greatest tan ever going on because I was golfing, right? And anybody yeah. golfs, you typically, you know, you, you can wear a glove on your non-dominant hand when golfing. Uh -huh. And what that does is makes for a really neat tan line on your left arm. So from <laughs> the end of my shirt sleeve, up to my wrist is lobster red, and then I am the whitest motherfucker on earth. From my wrist <laughs> to my fingertips, it looks it looks so it looks so great. It looks it, it's it's incredible. And then my my legs got so roasted. My my sock burn line is ridiculous. Oh wow. <laughs> and now I have to find even lower cut socks to wear right now because like I don't want. To anything touching that bird oh my god and i'm sorry for laughing so <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> it's white privilege everybody you know being out in the sun and getting fried because you're too stupid to remember to wear something this is what happens when tuscans unwrap their bodies and expose their flesh to the sun exactly <laughs> exactly like i now i get why they're wearing that heavy freaking robes and masks and shit um <laughs> And Fortunately, I was smart enough to wear a baseball cap, so the the <laughs> bald top of my head didn't get absolutely destroyed. Because that's actually, <laughs> I mean, other than private parts, the top of the head is one of the worst spots to get burned if you're a bald guy. Um, mm -hmm. Because, like, okay. you know, that skin moves like every facial expression you make moves that skin somewhere. And then the shower, you know, ob you know, the, uh. the water, that's the first place it's hitting. And like, <laughs> And then if you're if you're one of those people that are you know still sporting the lovely comb over, then you're in real you're really screwed, because then uh -huh. you got to brush that or comb that thing over, and if it touches the scalp, it's, ouch. But fortunately, you know I I I'm not sporting the comb over look. I just I tell the barber, yeah, hit me with the hit me with the number one, or no adapter on the top. Oh wow! Oh goodness gracious! I I I would only know about like sunburn on the scalp, like if I go dance at a powwow, and so I have my hair parted in the middle, like oh, I right have at the part, yep, part Ow. on the left, and then goes down the middle, and then so having that. But I do use like um 
I do put like some kind of conditioning spray that has SPF in my hair as I braid. Mm -hmm. So that, because you can still get sunburn, but it's your exposure is not as bad as if you're basically bald. I wouldn't know how that feels because I've never been bald. And not I don't hard, recommend I don't trying to. it. Like, you know, you look good with mm -hmm. hair. I would, I would suggest keeping it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I love my hair. I love that. But I know like in those areas that are exposed from being out in the sun Ooh, all day, ouch, yeah, yeah, it can be very tender, but I can't imagine the whole entire scalp, you know, your whole dome being burnt. <laughs> I've had, I've had that happen and it is not pleasant, but even like wearing like just, if you're wearing a baseball cap and not like a cowboy mm -hmm. hat or anything with like a brim all the way around, yeah. you still, there's, there, there's still one little tiny problem. That's the ears, top of the ears. Oh God, yeah. Almost fortunately, so fortunately, those didn't get too too toasty. So, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm it, I can wear I can wear my headset comfortably. Oh, and nice. Not have, <laughs> and not and not have it hurt. So. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to summertime when every part of your body can get burned some way, shape, or form if you don't wear any type of protection. <laughs> yeah, welcome don't be a dumbass and wear the the problem is is it's very deceiving. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Even getting off the course, and it was a very, very slow round. And I know this is not Star Wars related. I'm sorry, but yeah. Um, at the time leaving the course, it was like, ooh, yeah, I got some sun. Oh, well, it doesn't feel too bad. Mm -hmm. But then it just keeps getting worse even after you leave the sun. Because I spent the rest yeah. of the day in the shade because I knew like, ooh. <sighs> yeah. Ooh. <laughs> better better lay off the sun for the rest of the day and you know i spent the rest of the time in the shade and everything but it just kept getting darker and hurting more and more and more and it's just like uh, oh boy you, you don't can realize get it until later yeah you can get sunburned from it being in the shade yeah you can still get sunburned from the shade it depends on the type of day the time of the day and stuff like that and hopefully you have someone and our aloe with you that you can rub all over those burnt areas to help you heal a little bit quicker um i made a trip to walgreens the next morning yeah. Oh my goodness. And welcome to coffee chat where we're talking about <laughs> summertime exposure of the sun. So you guys be safe out there now that you're enjoying this beautiful weather and getting outdoors. So let's go ahead and see who's in the chat here. I had a few people waiting already. So Alex um, Sarkashi, I, uh, Sarkashi, um, sorry if I butchered that. I understand. I know how it feels to have a name butchered and I apologize. And, oh, he's related to, um, Jedi Horn. Ah, uh, gotcha. So they're talking about Rostec Horn. We are going to discuss basically the horns and Nisha Halcyon, um, with what Stackpole has to say. And Tim, you know, can weigh in on what he knows about the lore, even in Disney, because he's been reviewing some of it with, on, um, with, basically Raging Rhino um, on his channel so he can have some insight as well. Did you just call um, me Tim? Not Tim. I'm sorry. Greg. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's a compliment. Tim's a cool guy. So, you know, I'm not insulting. <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, hopefully he shows up too because he can give a lot of good insight about the horns as well because of the X-Wing series. So I apologize. And then we have Dharmit here. So thank you for coming in. Greetings, my friend. And these guys were waiting well into like maybe like an hour. And thank you guys for hanging out here as well. And they're just having a little conversation there. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. Um, oh, here grumpy, we have a, we have a... old ninja. Thank you for coming. A super chat coming in. Uh, yeah, we have a, a phonetic. Uh, it's Scarbro Scarbrowski for Alex's last name. Scarbrowski. Scarbrowski. Oh, okay. Scarbrowski. 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 Okay, I asked awesome. him to phonetically awesome. spell it in the chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I got it. I haven't scrolled down there yet. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And before I move on to say hello to everybody, I do have the poll up and it's your favorite favorite EU authors, Troy Denning, Alan Alston, and Michael Stackpole, which we're going to discuss today and James Lucino. So, so far, Troy Denning has 8%. Alan has 17. Michael has 8%. So there's a tie between him and Troy. And then James Lucino has 67%. So right now it's unanimous for James Lucino. So that will stay up for a little while. Yeah, Lucino's then, dominating. Yes, he's kicking butt right now. And then um, Griffiths, hello, how are you doing? And Chaos Man, if Vader is Sidious, Sidious's fist, and that's what we're going to discuss to that article. So maybe we'll go through that article first, and then we'll get into this um, Michael Stackpole um, conversation on 
Twitter. Um, if Vader is Sidious's fist, then the 501st is Vader's fist. <laughs> so everybody's like, what the hell? Yeah, they just go down we the chain and just call everybody a fist instead of like a person. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's weird. And that's, well, that's sounds weird. cooler. Yeah, I know. It sounds so cool. It sounds so threatening. You don't, you don't need to give him a nickname for him to be threatening. You just got to listen and look at him and his demeanor. Well, maybe after Kenobi, we do. <laughs> like, they got to, like, re, um, reestablish his, his ruthless reputation because he, he uh -huh. seems to be a, a rather forgiving sort of fella. <laughs> uh, in, in the Kenobi series, so they they might have to rehab his 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 credibility. Uh huh. Oh God, I don't even. No, know. no, he's I, a fist. We swear. He's a fist. Yeah, he's gonna like basically hammer down on his authority for Sidious. Oh my God. But yeah. <laughs> don't piss him off, or he'll stab a hole in you and then walk away and let you live. Right. Twice. Oh my God. That's how many people have lived so far in Disney Star Wars with just by getting a stabby stabby from the saber? From the top of my my head, just a pure uh -huh. stab in 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 the TV Disney Plus era and in the sequels. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well we'll start with the sequels. Um, uh, uh, ben Solo okay. gets stabbed, run through by Ray, and then four sealed, so he made it right. Um, then, then you have, uh, the grand inquisitor. He got ran through in Kenobi and lived. Uh, you have Reva who got ran through twice, two different times by Darth Vader and has lived. So, you know, counting her as twice, that's, that's four just stabs that mm -hmm. off the top of my head that I can think of. Qui-Gon's the only one who can die by a stab wound. <laughs> And on top of that, and I think this is what began this, like everybody could just live some way somehow. Maul got resurrected, even though he got sliced in half. Yeah, he wasn't head. even stabbed. He was he was sliced. I mean, his is the worst of all, honestly. And I still do not understand people who like if you're going to complain, like I've complained about Maul, I don't know how many times if you've watched the other streams I've been on, you you guys in the chat have heard it. But like, if you're gonna justify that one, I don't know. Like, I guess, yeah, everybody should be able to survive getting stabbed in the mm -hmm. chest. I mean, I, you just got to be angry enough, I guess. Yeah. And that's a mistake. And you, you could you could make a plausible thing and be like, well, technically he could have survived and cushioned his landing while sliced in half and and then crawled away and he was super angry and 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 oh, the the lightsaber cauterized rule. Put all that stuff aside and understand, like, from a narrative standpoint when you have people run th run through or sliced mm -hmm. in half with your most iconic weapon in your in your ip you're diminishing the, your iconic weapon in your ip like you nice. just you can't if getting stabbed with a lightsaber isn't a sure death then then why show it at all Right. at this point now now every time i see somebody do a stabby move i'm like why well one why are you stabbing with a lightsaber anyway i mean it's a slashing weapon not a stabbing weapon mm -hmm. I, like i you wouldn't yeah. like if i'm going for the kill i'm 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 doing like anakin to dooku you know whoosh, off with the fucking mm -hmm. head pardon yeah. i don't pardon the language <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. No, it's okay. I, I don't. But, I, really, yeah, I don't, you I don't, know, me, I don't know if you are a cusser on your own channel or not, but. I am. I am. And you know, what's, what's kind of ironic is like last copy chat I did, was it last copy chat? I did go over an article from um, Screen Rat and I did kind of agree oh, with them on this point, which is not very often because they're a shitty ass, you know, um, you know, media outlet I guess five ways say. Anakin Skywalker is awesome and in five ways he's not Screen right yeah .com. yeah but the thing is is that they have the same point that we're making about the lightsaber isn't that crazy well like <laughs> like, like when you when you ask an average <laughs> an, an average normie um mm -hmm. a person who doesn't even like or watch Star Wars all the way up to the diehard EU elitists like you, mm -hmm. you say like, what is the most iconic thing in Star Wars? And it's 
overwhelmingly going to be the lightsaber. Mm-hmm. Like every kid who played Star Wars growing up, what are they, they they weren't really playing with blasters, were they? They were they were they were smacking sticks together and, and lightsaber battling. It's it is the franchise, and to take that weapon and yeah. diminish its usefulness. Not just that you can survive stab wounds, but you can just use the force to deflect slashing shots now. Because that that mm-hmm. was something we saw in Rise of Skywalker. And now in in this Kenobi series that we just like whoop, block it with the force, like you're yeah and, you're making your iconic weapons suck. What are you doing? Yeah, and why didn't Anakin use that like to deflect like from his hand getting chopped off? If that's you know, because I understand that you know that you know all like in the original lore, it was designed that every force user had a distinct ability and some abilities they couldn't use through the force like corn horn for example since we're talking about the family corn horn was not strong at all in telekinesis so there was a lot of things he couldn't do however there were some force abilities that he was very strong in so it kind of balanced uh, balanced it off yeah but see that's such a basic bitch force thing that i wouldn't think that anybody would be that terrible at it that they couldn't possibly or conceivably use it though yeah yeah but the yeah, I know, but the point is, is like everybody had a certain range of force abilities. Like not everybody could be force healers. Like Luke wasn't a force healer, similar to Barris Alfie, where she goes and basically hands on heels and stuff. That character, he has to put himself into trance and use the force and stuff, and he can't just sit and heal people like that. And um, so there's well, there's and it's not like insty heal a wound through the chest either. We're talking right. about like, like, like other minor non-mortal wounds and that again Mm -hmm. is like anytime in any franchise eu uh movies tv or whatever when when you give users a technology like back Mm -hmm. to in a can or or a force ability or a magic ability if it's if it's some other fantasy movie or something like that you have to set some ground rules and some restrictions Otherwise, everything becomes meaningless if it can just be undone with a snap, you know? Right, right. So and you, that's where they got to have careful. mortal wounds just be like, you're healed. Yeah. I mean, that's, like, I mean, you can, but it's bad for tension and drama. Right. And that's the point here with this lightsaber and blocking it or just being able just to basically just stab them like a little needle, like you're giving a shot and then you walk away. <laughs> That's how I see that. But kiss my We're going to see says, Darth Fauci. He, like, he's going to have a big needle lightsaber. <laughs> Jab! <laughs> I can't believe I went there. But Dark, uh, or Chaos Man says, Darth Sion, who basically is a Sith from the old ancient times, old Republic, like 3,000 years plus, so further from, you know, our standard movies timeline. And he says, Darth Sion is a living example of anger, literally keeping someone alive. He has to be angry all the time and always in constant pain. But he's one of those anomalies. So that that wasn't a thing that always happened all the time in the lore. He was one of those anomalies, one of those exceptions to to the rules. We always going to have that one exception to the rule. But when you take that one exception to the rule in that story and insert it every other thing, it takes away from that story arc, from that character and it not being used anymore now to be in something that just basically cheapens the lore. So, yeah, so a little history there for you. Um, there, there was that, but I think from over the centuries that that wisdom was lost um, with the Sith and we don't really see it as much. Um, we did see it a little bit with Darth Maul, but the difference between an Inquisitor using anger our um, revenge to stay alive and a Sith is that Inquisitors are not trained as Sith to even know that that um, ability and stuff. They're supposed to be a lot weaker. So that's why I question that, you know, with Maul in a way, if you want to go ahead and try to make sense with the Maul thing, even though I didn't agree with that either, is that he was a trained Sith. These guys aren't trained Sith. So I don't know if you want to weigh in on that or not, um, Greg, from what you know, and, and just give your opinion off of that. Um, I'll just say that, like, there's many things that the EU does that I don't particularly, like, I'm not a, uh, my headset's cutting out. (laughs) All right. (laughs) 
and I can tell he's outside. So just make sure you have protection on deer. <laughs> Yeah, so, and that's that's the thing here. And so I'm going to go ahead and start pulling up this article and then you could still weigh in on that once you get yourself situated, situated. Let me see, make sure I have the right, um, right one clicked. Um, let's see here. Doo, 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 doo. Yeah, and then sorry chat that I didn't go through and say hi to everyone. So if you're joining, thank you for joining in. Let me know what you're enjoying, your beverage, what's in your mug. Please hit the like button. Please share that we're live and go vote on your favorite author. Okay, let's see here. And we're going to go to classic screen wrap because I guess I've just been going tuning into them. But I thought that this, this caught my eye. And for those who know the lore, know the um, um, basically the 501st and why they're called, you know, the fists or um, Vader's fists or whatever. Um, and then this also harkens to, um, you know, emperor's hands and stuff. It's like posted quote unquote pay homage, I guess. I don't know. Um, that we would weigh in on this. So let's Am I back? see, but if you want to, hello, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Technical difficulties. So if you want to go ahead and <laughs> if you want to go ahead and just weigh in again, what you were saying before we move on I'll to this my article, thoughts. go ahead. Yeah. yeah like w when I, when I, hear about things that are happening in you know that have happened in the eu like i can say that like i'm in favor of the continuation of the eu and simultaneously also be like not everything they did was gold too right and i think mm -hmm. that's a common like gotcha thing that that people who who want to argue against the eu will will keep bringing up and be like well they did this and this was stupid in the eu and it's like yeah and a lot of people said it was stupid like, mm -hmm. like there's so there's such a humongous volume of work. Not everything is going to be golden. Right. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I would have preferred is that they would have kept the, the scale of force powers a little bit more grounded mm -hmm. um, yeah. because it just allows for better storytelling, because if you can basically just in one book invent a, yeah. new, a new force ability. And it's and but then simultaneously just go well the, just this guy had it. Well, then the next author can come along and be like, mm -hmm. well, I wrote myself in a corner. Um, well, they did it over here, so I'm going to say, well, oh, this guy also has it now too. And over time, yeah, you know, and and volume of works, it 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 makes it makes the story kind of less intense, less dramatic. Because there's mm -hmm. too many, there's too many corners that the writers can write themselves out of um, by just invoking yeah. what is essentially now just magic. Mm -hmm. It's just magic plot device, and like modern modern Star Wars is super super guilty of it. But like you know, so too I think the EU dipped a little bit too much into it for for my tastes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and you know the and the idea that you can just anger your way out of being bisected and falling down like. A, a, what appears to be a damn near bottomless shaft is is one of those things where I'm just like, no, I like I'm not buying it. If if you can bisect somebody and they can just be pissed off about it and then survive, it, you know, <laughs> like like <laughs> then then I should be seeing Jedi and Sith like hacking like J Jedi and and Sith into like many pieces to make sure that they don't stay angry. You know, yeah. like we should be like, they should be just keep wailing on them and slicing them until they're like in 20 different pieces. Yeah. Kind of like, of course, when the, you're not going to do I mean, in a TV show or anything like you're not going to make an rated R Star Wars. Right. Just like Luke was wailing on his, his dad at the end of Re, um, Return of the Jedi before, you know, he realized that he was succumbing to anger <laughs> because of his fear. <laughs> you know how he's all, whoosh, whoosh, you know, kind of deal. Yeah, well, I mean, and, he's, um, he's, you know, he's I angry. I mean, he shouts out now. Nah! Oh, and I mean, which is a great dramatic scene, probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite mm -hmm. scene in all of Star Wars. Mine is too. specifically mm -hmm. that that Return of the Jedi throne room fight scene yep. between Vader and 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 Luke. And it wasn't something that was super flat. They, people, they, they were, people weren't flipping around and doing acrobatic things. It was very as far as the fight choreography it was very very basic but the, the music behind it the tension the build up all of that was made it such an intense incredible fight right yep like it was it, it was it, it probably is my favorite scene 
Yeah, it was how they, how they, um, how their dueling was, the emotional weight, you know, the words that were mm -hmm. said between the two, all of that, the music. I mean, John Williams added so oh, much weight to that. Cool. So that's much in weight that, yeah. in that scene. It was fantastic. I, I like, uh, and then you listen to the score of things like Kenobi, and you're just like, oh my god, this might as well be just like, <laughs> like on a on a children's play keyboard, it, like one of the preset like tempo things. So, can you recognize John Williams' score for Kenobi in that? Like, I hear hints of of Williams themes. Every now and yeah, then. because he only did one score in that, and that's he was like, I finally get to do Obi Wan Kenobi score because I never had the opportunity. However, he did do a score for Obi Wan Kenobi, and that was for his death. So he did. So, but he's basically like, I finally get to do a theme score for Obi Wan Kenobi. So I'm like, okay, let's see if this puts any weight or, or you know, emotional weight and stuff context to it, and. I can't recognize it. Like from what I heard in the clips that were given to me, I can't recognize anything from him between the other composer for that. Well, I'll be honest in Kenobi and, and, and actually all the Disney plus shows really, to be honest, the, the score is something that is just forgotten. Like it doesn't stand out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, it's just like, yeah, it, it, it is just so plain and generic that like it just does nothing and it's like and that's yeah. a director and a producer issue there, there's certain certain directors are very very good at understanding how much emotional impact a good film score mm -hmm. can make george lucas yeah. is one of those and and, mm -hmm. and so so is um you know uh steven spielberg uh um, right i would i would say the you know Ridley Scott, like th th those, those kind of directors and, and, it, and it shows in the movies that they make. Yeah. Like you, you yes. can understand even, even, uh, um, uh, Cameron, James Cameron understands mm -hmm. like how much emotional weight and, and tension that just a musical score. And it doesn't have to be a bombastic score. Like, like back to the future where it's like it's blasting in your face like which is it's still a great score in back to the future but that theme song like it is like full volume nothing else is happening other than that that score at the time kind of thing but you yeah can, you can have the little subtle themes in there as well and it really does make the movie and that's something that i think is really lost on a lot of modern directors they just don't get they don't get it they don't understand it no they want the flashy fast action, you know, quick in your face type dramatic stuff. They don't want those quiet moments. If you can tell, if you see that lately, well, there's no quiet moments. And that was what George was perfect with, with Star Wars and, you know, and working with John Williams is creating those soft, quiet moments that still told the story and that still was impactful. And the music played also, well into that. It's also hard to write a score for the kind of action that seems to be like the the flavor of the day now. The very close, quick cut, quick cut, quick cut, quick, mm -hmm. quick cut, quick cut. Like, how, like it's like how do you write a film yeah. score if you're a film composer with with that kind of um, <laughs> editing? It, it would be like it, the the sound yeah. would be schizophrenic as as what you're seeing on film versus a lot of the you know. <laughs> A lot of the movies where we're thinking about these big sweeping epic scores, we're talking like wide shots, you know, you know, mm -hmm. dramatic, yeah. dramatic, like just dramatic cinematography, even during the fight scenes versus the cut, 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 cut. Right. It's like, so, it's like yeah. almost age, age, 80, 80, 80, HD, where it's like dog, squirrel, this, that, you know, kind of deal. It's like, you can't stay focused on the, the moment, the, the moment that's going on, you know, and getting, you know, really into it. And that, yeah, you're right. It's lost. It's lost. because well, it's, it's the like, style okay. of action that, that effectively fakes intensity uh -huh. because by cutting quickly like that, you can, you can make the fight seem a whole lot a lot quicker, you know, faster, yeah. more intense from to, to, to paraphrase a, a, a fine director um, and, and filmmaker. George? Yeah, but like that's, that's kind of a cheat. Last night. That's kind of a cheaty way to do it. 
I mean, uh -huh. the audiences eat it up. They like it. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. Like it works for stuff like born. Okay. That style mm -hmm. of movie. Sure. It yeah. works, you know, or like a John wick, maybe even, but like, I don't know. There's some pretty sweeping shots in, in wick. If I, if I remember the movies correctly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, I it's just, it's a, it's a film style now that I, I don't particularly enjoy. I, I, I like the, the bigger shots, the, the wider shots, the, you know, gets more of the scope. It doesn't all have to be like right in and on the, on the actor's faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And then chaos man, man says here, we're going to get into this article. Now we, we kind of went off. On yeah, sorry. We sidetracked it. You're going to end up with a nine hour stream with me on here. I know, right? We can. Um, but Chaos Man 17 says there were a whole bunch of dark side organizations in the Empire, the Inquisitors, which had more traditional organization, Emperor's Hands, which basically they were assassins. Um, Mara Jade, if you don't, you're not familiar with her story. Basically, she was sent off to regulate any kind of like corruption and, you know, and tyranny against the, the Emperor. So she was basically an assassin, an investigator assassin type, and that's what they were. With with force abilities, but she wasn't trained as a Sith. So, and then prophets of the dark side, shadow guards. So there's there's many of them, but they were all they weren't Sith. They weren't given that type of training. They were just taught to use the force, so that if they have to deal with a force user or whatever, that they were capable of doing so. And that there's a huge difference with that. Um, but we're not going to get into that. So let's get into this article now. So let's get past this article here. So Star Wars gives Darth Vader a new Imperial title. I didn't even know that he had an Imperial title anyways, other than his Sith name. Other than Lord Vader. Right. Darth Vader, <laughs> Lord Vader. Yeah. So Star Wars has given Darth Vader a new Imperial title, one that no doubt left the Dark Lord of the Sith enraged. He is the Emperor's fist. So he's mad about the title? Okay, so this is from Thomas Bacon. So I, you might have heard of this guy before. I'm kind of familiar with him and his takes. So let me get this ad. I need to get this pop-up ad thingy situated. All right, Star Wars Comics has given Darth Vader a new Imperial title. Palpatine's plan, and someone was commenting on his mask or his, yeah, his mask here. Um, Palpatine's plan for Anakin Skywalker were seriously disrupted when his new apprentice was defeated at Mustafar. I, I don't think it was disrupted because he still carried on with him. I mean, Anakin didn't give up. He still stayed a Sith. It's just that he was now, he's now on life support, but he's still capable. What do you think about that little line right there? Um, I guess his abilities would be diminished because he's lost so much of his own biological in limbs death, and things like really? that yeah yeah so and maybe I not. like he didn't like from 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 palpatine's perspective vader wasn't the ideal he wanted anakin as vader mm -hmm. anakin not 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 vader yeah because you know vader does have a lot more limitations than than uh you know an anakin with just one simple robotic arm yeah could have so I, like I, I guess, which was, I mean, but that's important, and that I, I, I like the idea of that, in a sense, because that would be a, a good reason for him to want and go along with Vader's idea or suggestion that Luke be turned to the dark side. Because mm -hmm. yeah. Luke, I mean, even Palpatine yeah. says, like, take your father's place at my side, you know. Yeah. And Luke was healthy, was just missing one hand. Mm-hmm which was replaced i mean he was had his father's potential mm -hmm. much younger somebody that was going to be around and mm -hmm. and somebody he could do more with like i i guess yeah and that's true but that's like 19 plus years away so yeah but i get yeah. it i i do understand that you know of course if you get into the lore that you know your in-depth force abilities once you start losing limbs because of the midichlorians and not everybody agrees with that i think it's interesting because i go i like science and mythology all of that together um the force can still stay mystic even if you kind of understand like how it's harnessed to the body or how the body uses its energy well, even if you don't go with like the midichlorian part and you just you erase midichlorians out of the vocabulary, uh -huh. I think you can still say that Vader loses a lot of force ability 
simply because divorce is defined as something that penetrates living things. Right. And like, obviously mm -hmm. a side, you know, a cyborg legs and cyborg arms aren't living tissue. They're, they're mechanical. Mm -hmm. And like, you don't have to have necessarily, I think, metachlorians uh, be the reason why, you know, losing so much body mass would, would reduce your force ability. It's because you're just, you're not as much of a living thing. Right. Yeah. He's, he's and, mostly machine now, as you know, Ben tells Luke, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, the yeah. OT. So, like you didn't need the metachlorians as a, as a reason to justify why Vader maybe isn't as potentially powerful as, as Anakin could have been. Yeah. Uh, fully turned to the dark side. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask this question. I'm not trying to stray, but this also goes with our conversation is, do you think George was better off staying with mythos rather than going into the scientific part of how the Lord, how the force can be used? Cause he did pretty um, well with the mythos and stuff like that. I, I will say this. I, I don't think metachlorians are like the gaff that people make them to be. I, I think it was a mistake to quantify it in that way. However, mm -hmm. it was not a major, it, it, to me, it doesn't break anything. It was just like, uh -huh. oh, that was like, that was an unnecessary explanation. I would have just like, if you, if you wanted Qui-Gon to be able to, to, to tell that this particular guy, boy was like off the charts, powerful, mm -hmm. you could just have him sense it with the force. Right. Like you don't, you, <laughs> oh, don't, need, God, to, you really don't need to make it into like a, a blood test or something like that. And, and the reason yeah. I don't like the blood test part of it is like, then like, like if I'm the emperor, mm -hmm. I'm putting in place a, a empire wide policy that every child that's born gets blood tested at birth before they get the birth certificate. Right. Like, right. so like you, you were immediately oh, going to detect any competition out there in the entire galaxy at the moment they're born. And and registered as a citizen of the empire, um, mm -hmm. they get blood tested to, for for the midichlorian count, and and you know if it's over a particular range, they get confiscated. Right now, obviously, yeah. people Either wouldn't all submit to the test, right. so there would still be you know leaks that get through and and, and such things because you know parents wouldn't be like, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't want to get my kid tested and then possibly taken away. I want to keep my child. I don't care, but. So people would try and skirt yeah. that, but on the major populous planets that that the Empire has absolutely full control of, I I could foresee them being able to successfully do that. Yeah, yeah. And that's, don't that's give ideas don't now because I'd be cra kind of crazy. Well, I mean, you <laughs> yeah, know, like, yeah, because but lucky they really do down that path. we register births all the time. You know, in the original you know, in they... the United States for citizenship, you get a birth mm -hmm. certificate. Thing. you know it's it, like it's not right. that implausible that a, uh, an all you know powerful um dictatorial government could could Dictator. force some sort sort of mandatory testing scheme mm -hmm. yeah 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 and you know that's that's just the whole thing right there but we'll go on with this here so let's see here where i was at um he said he devoted so much time to, to seduce the boy to the dark side, and he was unwilling to see all the efforts wasted. And that goes into our conversation here. And so he had Darth Vader transformed into a cyborg. Well, he wanted him still. He was still his tool. So he needed him to be on life support. So and his true identity became a closely guarded secret. There you go. And that's why I question why yeah. Reva, how Reva knows. Yeah. And then like the, the uh, yeah. Uh, it, the, the only thing that that's possible is that he, she overhears somebody call him Vader at the time. That's to me yeah. the only plausible. And that's not revealed. Even knows. And that's not something we've mm -hmm. seen. It's just something we have to write for them in between scenes off camera. Um, is yeah, it possible that that happened? That Absolutely. It, it's, it's possible and very plausible that she would overhear that at some point while in the temple. Um, mm -hmm. But then why not show that to, to make it clear? And unless they're going to have, I right. think they're, we're going to get one more flashback to the temple um, in the next episode. So we'll see. And I, oh God, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about everything this last episode. I am excited oh, to hear. It's going to be a doozy. I, like, man. <laughs> And those who've been keeping me up on some of the points and stuff, just 
just let me know what happens too. So, all right, so let's move on. The sense of mystery meant Darth Vader was all more terrifying. Some believe he had been created using separatist technology, the same technique that created General Grievous. Others speculated he was Palpatine's secret weapon held in a reserve throughout the Clone Wars in case the Jedi ever betrayed the Emperor. Well, those are kind of, I guess you could say, creative. This theory at least accorded with rumors Darth Vader had led the clone in attack the clones in attack on the Jedi Temple at the beginning of Order 66. Um so the rumors, so they're saying it's rumors and stuff like that. And you know, I don't know much about like what they said about how Anakin died in the in the new lore, but in the original, basically that you know it was said that he basically died protecting the temple, like he died at the temple. Um and that's it. So I don't know exactly what happened and what the rumors were um about Anakin in the new lore. So and I didn't research it and maybe I will later. I don't know. Star Wars comics have given Vader a new imperial title to define his role. That of the emperor, Emperor's Fist. So here we go, you guys. Here it is, the Emperor's Fist. All right. The designation has been used twice now in Age of the Rebellion, Darth Vader number one and Darth Vader number 24. And it's really been referenced, um, referenced in one novel. It's already excuse me, it, um, it perfectly describes the role Darth Vader had in Apprentice uh, um, and his apprentice play in in the galaxy. So the role of the, Darth Vader had it, had his apprentice play in the galaxy. His apprentice, he has apprentice. Darth Vader has an apprentice. Is that what I'm reading? It perfectly describes the role Darth Vader had his apprentice play in the galaxy. I think the his there is that the role Darth Vader had um Sidious's apprentice play in the galaxy that's the his yeah yeah I'm like yeah because his apprentice we Palpatine's. knew basically and I okay. yeah yeah okay yeah so I was like I got confused I was like what the hell his um he was Palpatine's enforcer the iron fist striking out at anyone who would dare oppose the empire the emperor okay so if you know the Lord, 501st was Vader's fist, right? And um, he basically, you know, kept it almost intact even after the clones stopped being used. Um, he favored those who were very um, well inclined and in depth to take orders, um, you know, had good, great fighting skills, all of that. He, he wanted those elite people, right? And so that's why he was, gift that's why he had the 501st. And um it is also said in the lore, and this I'm going back to original lore, that um, anybody who, um, you know, people wanted to be a part of um, Vader's, um, you know, um, like be on his ship, you know, and stuff, because there's a lot of advancements and promotions. It was the best in the overall. Being under Vader was the best overall um, in the, the Empire and stuff. So people wanted that type of promotion even though sometimes you may not live past a certain stage because if you piss him off he chokes you out you know basically so the title is a riff on an idea from the old expanded universe where palpatine had a number of operatives named emperor's hand mostly notable mara jade so everybody knows her you know so the woman who would eventually become luke skywalker skywalker's wife both titles subtly stress the lack of um, autonomy, for they indicate the respective individuals were defined by their relationship to Palpatine himself. Now, um, I understood that they're assassins. That's basically what they were. It was assassins, and they did his bid, and they made sure that no one, like there was no, there was no um, tyranny or anything like that towards um, the, the Empire and towards um, towards um, Sidious himself. The hands were devoted as at. Who I'm sorry. I'm just confused as to who was who, who didn't already make that connection before this this title. Like who who out there was thinking mm -hmm. like Mara Jade and 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 Vader and everything weren't acting on be on behest of the Emperor. Mm -hmm. Like like to me, it's just like that's drawing a connection that's pretty already obvious. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they, they like, worked. Like, there's just and no there's, need for clarification there because, like, who who else would they have been working for? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And there was some, there are some people that didn't know exactly who she was because some of her stuff was very top secret. So like when she went into like certain like large events um, where um, that the emperor held and stuff, she was basically just either a dancer or entertainer or just basically a pretty face there because of the emperor, you know, and stuff like that. Well, yeah, but and that's then just there are, that's well, her being undercover. That's still pretty correct. standard fare. Like that doesn't need explanation either. Like mm -hmm. what are, yeah. what are we explaining? Exactly. By, by doing yeah. the hand and the fist and all that other stuff. It's just like, it's just silly stuff to me. That's just designed to be like, Oh, it sounds cool. Now we can, yes. now we can market a Vader, a Vader, um, action figure that says, emperor's fist instead of darth vader on it mm -hmm. yeah like all right Padme's so let's go. fist <laughs> you have to go there <laughs> <laughs> been sitting on that one all stream may the force be with you okay <laughs> okay let's move on <laughs> That, of course, is likely how oh, Palpatine intended it. Sith are like, fueled by miss. anger and rage. <laughs> you, I would question someone's force ability <laughs> if they miss. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whoops, I got you in the face. <laughs> 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 okay all right so we went that way so and i told you you could take this in so many directions you sure did you invited me on you had to know what this direction was coming i know i know and and you like it's it's fine i'm just cracking up at this it's fine it's fine so this here we go so the sith are fueled by anger and rage we know that that kind of sustains them like I've argued so many times because people are like, oh, Kylo lost to Ray because he was injured. He was, you know, impelled or the, the you know, the bow, that crossbow, whatever, I forgot the name of it that Chewie has. You know, basically, um, there we go. Um, I, I automatically go to the other one, but yeah, he got hit by that. And so now he's in pain. And so he's not focused, blah, 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 blah. And he's weak. And then so my argument was like, OK, but they do use the anger to help sustain them long enough to defeat it sometimes it doesn't happen that way or what have you and that goes with now with the revenge sustaining you so you could survive a um you know a, a jabby jabby stabby stabby from the life's lightsaber so i think that they're taking this to extreme now to where there's well, no mean, um there's no risks anymore there's if no you go back and watch the force awakens like ray survives something that's that's pretty incredible because mm -hmm. <laughs> and and Finn. Right. Finn gets slashed up the back with the lightsaber and it's just like oh we're gonna give you a silly suit and you'll be fine in a couple hours um but Ray if, if you watch that thing Kylo uses like not just like force push but like force cannon blast like he throws her like across the forest into a gigantic tree at like freaking full speed like i'm sorry she's out she's like if you think the wound uh that that yeah. the kylo has from the from the bowcaster that hit him in the armor plate was was like difficult like ray got thrown like a hundred and some miles per hour into the trunk of a tree <laughs> she's concussed like if she mm -hmm. if she wakes up she's she's woozy but, it, you know, that's just the silly choreography yeah. that we get now. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, of course, people will debate it. She would have been, been in those debates like and stuff. And it's 300 broken bones, man. <laughs> she would have been shattered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, she literally was slammed up in the tree. You would think that she, she would have been like paralyzed, paralyzed at least or barely moving because of the impact of the spine. Who knows? Right. I mean, um, it, anyway, so let's I go mean, on. They, they don't arc. portray it as like she had a cushion landing. I mean, it was like, boom, she hit that freaking tree trunk, that gigantic yeah. tree trunk. She, she's out. I'm sorry. Ridiculous. Yeah, she should have had a concussion. She have lost her, lost all her breath. That wind should have been knocked out of her. She should have been broken stuff, man. But she just gets up and walks like, okay. And then she the saber comes KO'd to her. But, you for know, like a, a whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and then heavily right, concussed right. and like not even like not even able to speak clearly much less like concentrate on the force or anything 
not even remember. I mean, she was been seeing days. stars. Right. Yeah. Seeing stars in Star Wars. All right. So let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. And after, um, and every master is resent, um, is resented by their apprentice or every master is resented or resented by their apprentice. It's easy. Oh, we're talking about the Sith here. So yeah, the apprentice wants to basically kill their master to become the master. That's the rule of two, but the rule of two doesn't apply in this lore anymore. They, they've totally just destroyed that. It's easy to imagine Darth Vader hearing the title uttered and responding to a situation in an even more bitter, fierce manner, just as Palpatine wanted. So he's just calling that as a, he's just basically bullying Vader then. Okay, I lost my spot here. I hate when this shit jumps on me. Um, Where did it go? Okay, down here. Yeah, so he's just basically bullying him then just to piss him off. Like, I know that this is going to get on your nerves. So I'm going to continue to call you that, like gaslighting kind of deal. I don't know. You know, so, but anyways, curiously, there have been references to the Emperor's hands in canon, um, but they seem to have served a, served a different purpose. Gar Saxon served as Emperor's hands when he ruled Mandalore on Palpatine's behalf, and it's quite possible their loyalties govern, um, loy loyalists govern key, governing key territories were given that same title. Also, oh, they changed the Emperor's hands to being just basically um, self imposed, you know, like self inserted rulers taking over these um, territories or sectors instead of now being assassins. So that's the change, you guys. That's the change of the Emperor's hand. So there you go. Um, if that is indeed the case, the canon emperor's hands were, oh, that's not canon, it's a name only, um, were rulers, warriors, and administrators rather than field operatives. Darth Vader would have looked upon them with scorn, aware they were puppets and all in time remembering his own title. Oh, okay, so looking at them and then he's like, oh yeah, I'm emperor's fist. Oh my god. Wow. Um, and reminder, to, he too was just a plaything as far as the greatest villain of Star Wars was concerned. All right. So what do you think about that? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. So basically, he's like, OK, so um, this is just going to remind me that I am the Emperor's puppet. And um, and that's it. So let me see what you guys have to say about that. And hey, how are you doing? Um, let's see here. The um, the Basco scenario. Emperor's hands hand will forever be Mara Jade. Yeah, there's a few of them, and she thought she was the only one. He Emperor kept him secret in a sense because she learned later on that Lumaya was one of them as well. And let's see here. Alex says that Saxon guy rules over a bunch of Mandalorians with a cardboard like armor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's crazy and then orange hat review says that um de de legitimizes the regional governors right they're they're changing everything around but what is expected with star wars anyways with the new lore they they're changing things around we really no longer have the rule of two it's the the rule of the sith basically i don't know how to better explain it um so this is another deconstruction and we're going to get into Michael Stackpole's um, conversation on Twitter. And he's still, con he's still responding on Twitter as we are going through the stream right here. And um, so he really thinks that Cornhorn can fit considering that um, the Jedi order was never um, made or when it was, it was later and got defeated. And that Kylo Ren was the first one that he ever trained. Um, Grogu turned it down. Um, Leia turned down training as well. And that mostly all the Padawans or the younglings or whatever you want to call them, the learners, were children. He didn't have any adult um, Padawans at all. So there's no way that Horn Horn could fit in that timeline, even if, even in between when he started creating the Jedi Order. And, um, you know, so we'll get into that. Let's see what you have to say here. Yeah, in Rebel Saxon, Mandalorians get um, get killed by a single blaster shot on the torso while wearing Mandalorian armor. Ooh, that's bad. Um, I didn't get into that part. Um, how do you fit Cornhorn in between Ben Kylo and Rose Tico for fuck's sakes? <laughs> right, right. So here you have it. So now he's 
basically the emperor's fist and it's just to make you know basically make rage in him to keep him dark i guess to i don't know and i just i just don't think, yeah. don't think he needs a title there there's no necessary you don't need a title it's just the look alone and what he enforces and lord vader is all we need in the story go ahead greg well and it's i mean just think about how silly this is like so palpatine mm -hmm. with all of his resources his intimate knowledge of anakin like he he grew up mm -hmm. almost as like a surrogate father to, mm -hmm. to, to, to Anakin Skywalker. Like he, you know, like in the movies, it's portrayed like, you know, he, you know, regularly talks to Anakin as a bit of like a mentor figure and everything just to try to, to lure him in. And his idea of like, of all the ways to keep Vader angry is like, I'm gonna come up with a silly, like name calling routine to keep you pissed off. Like that's like, of all the things that you could tick Vader off with, like a silly, like title and name that, that like he doesn't like or whatever, that's what you're gonna go to. Mm -hmm. like, so essentially the, the, the emperor's like, nee, 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 nee. you're a fist. <laughs> yeah. And, like, and Vader's gonna be like, I'm so angry. Ah over that yeah. like basically like just keep reminding him that he killed padme mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah just keep reminding him of that right that's the only thing you need but on <laughs> top of that it's like he's so far gone like he's so far gone from anakin as being anakin right. into this new persona and he went through all this change he you know like being burnt limbs taken off living on life support and stuff that's enough in itself to keep him dark and keep him <laughs> right. on mission as you know, a sith lord <laughs> you know that's but, enough. but no that's we need to like you know twist the knife with a name calling I'm like, mm, you're yeah face. like yeah if it, lame i'm sorry that's lame it's very childish yeah so they're making the emperor very childish <laughs> like you said neener 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 <laughs> <laughs> like, that's that's what i'm picturing i'm like you're just i'm thinking you're just my fist bitch like really like, <laughs> that sounds so bad you got my fist bitch <laughs> yeah you're my fist you little bitch <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so there's that. Um, so take it as you will, you guys. Um, if you like Disney Star Wars, I hopefully that, you know, if if you try to give it a chance that this is something that you're like, no, thank you. Um, there's so many different reasons to turn your back on it because of the fact of the lore and everything being compromised, even to the movies, not even going into the EU, but into the movies, the heart of the movies that are the foundation of that. Or their own um, shows contradicting themselves. I mean, it's just like, it's all over the place. And you know, what was the one excuse right. they, they made? It is right? all. When, the the excuse they made when they when they ditched the EU was that they were going to have everything be the mm -hmm. same classification of canon. It's all G canon now. So oh, let's look at yeah. let's look at the results. Is it? Is it though? Because they keep contradicting mm -hmm. themselves and and keep having to like write excuses in for like bad writing decisions. And you know, it's it's almost like that's the whole role of the comic books now is just and and some of the the books that they're writing is mm -hmm. to write some convoluted um, excuse for for the mind bending stupidity of of their movies. And I just yeah. <laughs> like, like the, the, and they're not even they're not even staying consistent with their own new stuff. And they've barely had no, it. No, they're not. I mean, they barely, I mean, mm -hmm. they're just going to keep writing. And they're like, well, you didn't explicitly say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, Alex has something funny Funny. I'll show here pretty quick. But Palpit, um, Orange Chat Review says, Palpatine used the lesson of Darth Plagueis's, Plagueis's to stroke Vader's resentment and rage. Show me your greatest weakness so I know how best to undermine you. Show me your greatest need so I know to deny you. So basically just going back and, you know, say, you know, reminding him of um, Padme and stuff like that. Just like we said, but that's just in that context right there. You don't need much at all. You don't need to resort to name comp. <laughs> Which is so funny. Yeah, this stupid. idea is like but, being like Alex says, demeaned and demoted. Like, oh, this is your title now. 
God. Yeah, right. He doesn't. His title is Lord Vader. That's all. That's it. That's it. Darth Vader or Lord Vader. That's all we need to know. His presence, his voice, everything is what, you know, it installs fear. You don't need anything else. You don't even need to piss him off already because he's already in, pissed off at like where he's at, you know, for what he lost and all this other stuff. He has that in his mind. He has that conflict of, you know, having um, Anakin particularly show up and stuff. He has all this little bits going on. You don't really need to add to it. In Any Darth Vader's depth. head, he's, he's, always... he's the most victimized person in the entire galaxy. Mm -hmm. in, in his yeah. own like, and head so canon, basically... he's like, he, he's gotten screwed at every turn. Um, everything that he mm -hmm. loved was taken away from him, so on and so forth. Like the guy has already a very legitimate cause to, to be the angry person that he is, you know. Right. Then, you know, on top mm -hmm. of all that, then he got, you know, he got dipped in lava, basically, and you know, burned <laughs> to a crisp and delimbed. Like, you know, I don't know, that kind of pissed me off. I mean, I'm pissed off right. about the sunburn. Imagine, imagine, <laughs> imagine going through with Anakin. <laughs> he went through. Right. <laughs> and he lived on Tatooine, too, so he probably knows what sunburns are all about. <laughs> right, right. So imagine that. <laughs> Be like you know, like okay, like if, so if, if I'm if I'm if I'm Palpatine and I want to piss Vader off, I'd be like, <laughs> Vader, I have filled your back to tank with sand. <laughs> you yeah, hate sand. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Oh God. Now that's a funny parody right there. I mean, seriously. So this is what this comic makes me feel like. This is a parody, like neener, neener, neener. I'm, you know, ruling over you and you're my, you're my lap dog and I'm going to call you Emperor's Fist. Okay. Yeah. There you go. So, I mean, it's just, this is what Star Wars is now in, in the TV shows and everything. It is just like, well, but it'll look cool or it'll sound cool. Mm -hmm. And that's the all. problem that's is, is like, dangle the keys. When it doesn't have a, a a rational basis to it, it doesn't come off as cool. It just comes off as trying to look cool, which is even more mm -hmm. lame than just being not cool. You know, it's, it's one thing to just not be cool right. and be fine with it. And it's another to be like not cool, but trying to be cool. Like you're even lower on the scale of coolness then because you're trying too hard. That's Disney. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to get to this funny one right here. Sidious, if you Twilix won't bow to me, I'll shove my fist up your ass so far. I'll tickle your tonsils. Oh, my God. And Vader, please be, um, please be dancers. Please be dancers. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. So let's move on here. So speaking of, go, you know, using eu characters and you know and tr them not really knowing how to create their own story and when they do it they do it so horribly as example here what we just went through with vader's fist we do have um and i'm going to recap on what um um wrong wrong one what michael stackpole said yesterday in tweets and then um, I did a video on this, you know, saying, did Michael Stackpole really reveal that Cornhorn's being brought in? I highly doubt he knows, but I just wanted to go ahead and just put that out there because it's not true confirmation. And by what he's saying today, I don't think he even understands the lore to know if it's going to happen or not. But what saddens me is that he's welcoming it. He's welcoming the bastardization of his character. Um, just so that maybe he can get a royalty. And you were saying something to me behind backstage about these royalties, you know, and we know how Disney. Yeah, Disney's not exactly are. great at paying these things out. So mm -hmm. it exactly. might be less exactly. of a royalty and more of a like, you know, somehow he'll get an invitation back into the fold. As as far as, yeah. you know. Yeah, bragging rights. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just as far as mm -hmm. future work goes. Yeah. You know, because exactly. like, has, um, has, he, has he produced anything in the High Republic era? Like, I don't remember seeing. I mean, I guess I should look that up. I don't think he's writing right now for them. Yeah, I don't think he's an author for them right now. So maybe he does. Maybe he needs money. But I'm going to go ahead and let us um, update on the 
poll. So if you guys are joining and you haven't had a chance to vote, who is your favorite author? Troy Denning, Ellen Alston, Michael Stackpole, or James Asino. So Troy Denning is at 21. Ellen Alston and Michael Stackpole are both at 14%. And James Asino is still leaving, leading at 52%. So that's the standings right as of now. So let's see here. Um, so we have this here, and this is Cornhorn. He was first introduced, and I, I made a mistake um, um, on saying it was the X-Wing series. He was introduced in a short story, which I'm not too familiar with, familiar with a lot of short stories, so that was my mistake when I did the video here. But he is, you know, basically um, Michael Stackpole's creation. So he's the one that created him for the Star Wars lore. And he did, he did have a family, you know, um, Ter uh, Merrick's Tarek, he did have kids from her. He's basically one of the first generation of Jedis that Luke trains. And um, he, you know, he, there's a little compelling story with him on that. Um, he does first, <clears throat> excuse me, turn down um, training from Luke, but eventually goes in and becomes a Jedi. And then, you know, progresses to Jedi Master. And he does have the lineage of um, Jedi being in his family. His grandfather was a Jedi during the Old Republic um, times and died during the Clone Wars. I, I think in the beginning of it, I believe. I have to go back and research that history. It's been a while since I looked into it. Um, and so he was introduced this name of corn horn or corn not corn horn but corn was introduced in the show this little boy who is said to be around the same age in this time period so people are like oh yay corn horns being introduced and i'm like why are you celebrating this you already know what they do with these characters you know so that's one thing i don't get and then of course michael stackpole's um conversation here you know of course we already know that Patty Jenkins was inspired by the novels, um, the X-Wing novels. And of course, we already know like the reimagining of the covers and the renaming of the series to Rogue Squadron from X-Wings. If that's something that doesn't piss you off, then I don't know what will. And then again, saying that, oh, well, you know, um, he's thriving in Obi-Wan Kenobi series, basically saying Korn is. And so does that, is that a confirmation? I don't know. And then he goes on to say, have you missed the fact that Korn is in Obi-Wan Kenobi series? What do you think about that? Do you think this is a confirmation, Greg? No. Mm -hmm. No. Well, I mean, like, it can't be a con confirmation because it can't be the Korn horn that, that exists in Stackpole's books. Right. Like, the history, like, right. the, the events don't line up. And the thing the, the thing that's so irritating about the 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 use of eu characters in the modern disney era is that like look a, a person is is like you you as a person or me as a person we are the sum of our not just our genetic material but our our life experiences that's who Correct. the things that have happened, the decisions that we've made, the experiences that we've had all accumulate into the person that you are now. Like all those decisions, mm -hmm. all those things, all those life experiences, that's that's what makes a person who they are. And to change yeah. any part of that changes fundamentally who that person then is so to say like mm -hmm. we're going to rip off his look and his physical his physical look and his name and oh look it's right. the same character no it's not right it, 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 and, and it can't be because the life experiences that made cornhorn the character he was in the books can't possibly have happened in the disney timeline so these things what we're going to get is somebody that's completely different. And if it's somebody that's completely different, then what's the point of taking his name and his likeness other than it's just, you don't have to then, you know, do any kind of, of, of uh, concept art for what the character looks like. And, you know, you don't have to make up a name for him. It, it, you're just, you're literally 
-hmm. you're, you're the person that's going to be in the Kenobi show or, or these future shows is a person wearing a cornhorn skin suit. That's it. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if this, yeah. like, just because a, a character named Corrin is in Obi-Wan Kenobi, is it this Corrin Horn character? Even if it is, it's not. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of where I stand. Like, if, if, like, why are you doing it if, if you're not going to use, utilize the character's yeah. background? Or like, oh, we'll make up a new background that's similar enough that the character would be the same character. It, it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, and that's what... That's what Timothy Zahn and I didn't use him. I didn't use Timothy, nor did I use um, Karen Travis for the voting thing, because those are some of the most popular and maybe controversial ones. Um, and but my my point here with Timothy Zahn is that when he created Thrawn, he, he you know people are like, oh well, he tied him in pretty good that he can you know he mirrors and he can easily like. Um, you know, transition between the two lores because he's very, or he's similar and blah, blah, blah. He's not because he doesn't come from the same planet. His experience and how he is discovered by the emperor is very different. Um, there's no, you know, story with outbound flight with that, which is another huge experience and um, that really mm -hmm. dives into who he is. And, um, and well, then, who he you know, is and, and where and he's been he the whole time, you know. Right, exactly. And then how he disappears during the rebellion era, like mm -hmm. he gets sent into exile, but now in the Disney lore, he basically gets abducted by a space squid with Ezra. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. And so he, you know, and he knows who Vader is in, um, and I don't recall if he knows who Vader is in the original. Laura, I don't recall that, but um, so correct me if I'm wrong for those who know. Um, but I know that in the Disney full lore, he knows who Vader slash Anakin is, and so there's a huge significant like even his name with Ron Nerodo is basically in the original lore, that's his name, but in the Disney full lore, that's his adoptive name after he gets promoted as a an officer in the Chiss um military, basically. So yeah, so there, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of points that, you know, I've made in a, you know, in a video regarding that, and it doesn't fit, like, even his promotion um, is very different. Becoming a Grand Admiral is very different. And so that's the same thing here. And I did point this out in my video with this here yesterday, is that you're getting just the shell of the person, that not, everything that made him who he is as a character, and why we love him is now not there. Well, yeah, and there's ahead, like Greg. then there's the matter of this this big gaping, inescapable black hole that is in Disney canon is that there is no Jedi Order in Disney canon. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you follow right. through all the way through the sequels, Luke failed mm -hmm. with a bunch of younglings and then quit mm -hmm. to go Correct. hang out on on whatever the fuck the name of the planet was and he didn't train mm -hmm. anybody and right. he was a bitter hermit and he wanted the jedi to to, to die and, and all this bullshit. and then along comes ray and at the end of the series we have ray sledding in the sand uh, at luke's old farm and burying lightsabers and then igniting her own yellow one but like as of right now, as to the end of that movie, there is no Jedi Order. It it yeah. doesn't exist. So where does Corn Horn fit in when there's no Jedi? He would have to have been killed at the temple. And he survives past that timeline as well because he has two kids. He's married, all of this. But if Luke is said to keep attachment like um like how we see with him with grogu then there's no way that even cornhorn can have a family and kids and so well, that significantly say, changes let's, let's say cornhorn was a jedi and he was just not on the planet when when kylo and the empire or emperor destroyed the all the all the the facilities there um right. luke goes off and says i quit then then like then did Corrin Horn then be like, well, without Luke, I quit too? Or 
did he go off and start his own new Jedi Order? Like, like, it, like if the Grandmaster Luke just quits, then the whole thing's kaput. Like, I don't understand how that works. Yeah, because he's even said he's the last Jedi at the time, and then Ray get picks up the mantle basically. <laughs> yeah, and I just <laughs> and I there's just no don't one get... else. There's no one else. You would think Ahsoka. that Kylo Ahsoka's going to start the new Jedi Luke. Order. Right, you would think that Kylo would be hunting down someone like Ky um, like Corn. So now let's go ahead and go into this what if theory. So you know how they say like the Knights of Ren has started was formed after that, or I don't know how that goes anymore because it was supposed to, then it wasn't. I don't know. It's like the lore yeah. behind the Knights of Ren are so screwed up. So does that mean that Corn decided to be a part of the Knights of Ren then? If that's the possibility, I don't know. And see how that doesn't fit. <laughs> yeah you know so you know i mean like like the then, idea yeah. of of the like we're gonna have this jedi character from the eu come into the new timeline and be like but where are you gonna put them there's no mm -hmm. jedi order like th there's literally no yeah. jedi order luke completely failed right. didn't train and he didn't successfully train up one night in 35 years or, mm -hmm. or 31 years since since right. return of the jedi he did he, he he didn't successfully get one student to the rank of Jedi in Disney canon. Mm -hmm. right. So there's no Jedi order. Exactly. And, and he is, he is somewhat close with Wedge and Tilly's, which Wedge in the lore and the original lore, he stays active in the military for a very, very long time. Even when he goes and decides to retire, he gets called back. And there's a conflict in um, Legacy of the Force. And I wish Tim was here. And I know he's busy getting prepared for family visits and stuff like that and work um, that, um, you know, that Corellia, like those who are from Corellia and the Galactic Alliance, and there's this big, huge separation and Corn Horn kind of goes on his way and, you know, wedges from Corellia too so there's this big huge conflict and split but they kind of still stay together in a sense and so that's not there anymore so a lot of this in this depth of um like lore and character and even stories it doesn't fit into this to even make this character significant to who he is and um yeah so so let's see here. And I think that's the end of this, but I'm going to go ahead and bring up that the conversation here since we're, we're discussing it. Cause there's some points I already hit that from the conversation that's, that was created today. And I was like, Oh my, I kind of was expecting Michael to chime in, but then I kind of wasn't, um, I, you know, but he did chime in, um, greatly significantly. I mean, there's different, he responded to a lot of people on my timeline here. And let me see here. Is it up? There we go. Yeah. Let me go ahead and get this one out of the way. And sorry, chat, I'm not responding to you guys, but I know you guys are having some great conversations in there. Um, so basically, I did retweet it. You know, he said, have you missed the fact that Korn is in Obi-Wan Kenobi? And that's what we're talking about. And basically, I said, if that's the case, it's in name only, not the character we know and love. You know, and then so he starts chiming in on people here. And... Um, get that out of the way. So basically EU commando says, considering a huge part of this, his character is being a Jedi and being part of the Luke's order and seeing how Luke's order went and how all of the or, um, other Jedi besides Rey die. I think it's safe to say this corn is in name only. And then Michael responds, minor point, corn can still be a Jedi. Sure. The Jedi Academy stuff didn't appear in canon now or to be canon now but luke is training apprentices i don't know where he's training apprentices right now all that's required is for corn to study under him swap some details and the cognate points of corn story still works what do you think about that no <laughs> in, unless corn dies mm -hmm. on one of the planets that gets blowed up in the force awakens no because here's the issue like okay so luke trains corn somewhere else off screen and and we never see it and he's not there when when shit goes down at the temple the new temple um and he hears that mm -hmm. luke skywalker has quit and disappeared which is something that everybody seems to know because they're all looking mm -hmm. for him right that's the whole plot of force awakens right so Mm -hmm. 
Cornhorn hears that Luke is gone missing and nobody can find him. And all this shit was going down with the First Order. Where's Cornhorn? Like, why is he not part of the resistance? W what's he doing? Right. Like, so you, you not only right. have to say that he gets trained off screen somehow, some way by Luke and is off planet at the time that the events happened at the, at, at the new temple. You then have to explain how he's then doesn't get reinvolved with any of the fight against the emperor in the events mm -hmm. of the force awakens the last jedi and and the rise of skywalker and it's again this yeah. problem that we have with all these jedi surviving order 66 and then not being present in any way at all during the events of the original trilogy it's a problem mm -hmm. and it's a hole that they just can't fill so like you can't I can't believe that he exists, is trained, is 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 still um, in spirit, a part of the, and a believer in the whole order and all that other stuff, but then just doesn't show up for any of the pivotal, galactically important events of the sequel trilogy. Mm -hmm. Was he was he like Leia? He was in a coma for <laughs> half a movie. Yeah, that's a thing, and we're gonna go into this some more because, and I like I said before that. He does respond in various little, um, you know, um, tweets, responses to me. So I'm not going to try to find hunt them all down. And I didn't have time to really, you know, cut and paste and make a little strip of everything he says. So we're just going to go down the line here, here. So basically I said here, Luke creates an academy which gets destroyed. Jedi killed. No knights, our masters survived. And, um, you know, basically we don't, from the looks of it, he really didn't have any knights. There wasn't no masters because if there was masters, then we would have known in the story a lot of them were padawans and a lot of them were like maybe teenager at best when you look into the comics so there was no night and of course there was no other masters because luke was the only master by time you get to that timeline corn horn is a master so that takes away from that and what michael stackpole says is and this failure failure takes place in mandalorian 50 plus 15 years, give or take, a lot of water under the bridge, which allows a ton of stories. So this tells me he really maybe doesn't know the stories, the lore, past maybe what he's maybe have watched in the movie or the series that are on Disney+. Plus. Well, he's saying that, like, so Mandalorian takes place in 9 slash 10 ABY. So, and The yeah. Force Awakens right. takes place in, like, 33, 34 ABY. So there is a gap there. So he's saying like, well, they didn't specifically mm -hmm. say that Luke didn't train <laughs> other Jedi and they're just out there around the galaxy doing their Jedi good deeds. And it's like, yes, right. but by having them not participate in any of the events of the sequel trilogy itself, it's implied that they don't exist because if they did, why aren't they involved? Mm-hmm. So you'd have to write yeah. that somehow Cornhorn gets gets trained, joins the Jedi Order, gets trained by Luke, is off on a mission, then gets killed on some other mission sometime before the events of the the temple destruction in the the Force Awakens flashback. So, or he just like disappears completely. Or he just disappears completely. Like, well, I guess that's possible, but how stupid would that be? <laughs> right. You have a valuable um, character that is a phenomenal character in the EU and a major player in Luke's Jedi Order being recreated or the new Jedi Order being, you know, brought or, you know, being brought back, the order being brought back and stuff. And all of a sudden, bam, he disappears, you know, and when when Luke well, starts. OK, so Luke starts looking for that damn Wayfinder um, holocron, Sith holocron, yeah. blah, 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 with Lando, like shortly after, like um, around the Mandalorian time, er, time frame. So where does he have time to train for that? And then after that, you know, finally, then his nephew starts going dark and Leia sends him to him. And then he so he decides to establish the academy to start training. So where's the time to train other Jedi during that time frame, other than at the academy? Well, even 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 if there is, Again, you'd have mm -hmm. to you'd have to believe all these Jedi 
that have survived all the way through the through Order sixty six through the OT, and that are just out there, just around the galaxy, hanging out. Hear that the Empire is gone. The Jedi are back. Luke is 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 running a a is reestablishing the Jedi Order. They all jo- rejoin the Jedi Order. Then all through random acts of pure coincidence, managed mm-hmm. to get killed in horrific accidents all before the events of the force awakens because there's no jedi other than luke skywalker involved in the sequel trilogies uh, unless unless you want to count ray and then by extension like finn kind of maybe could be eventually trained but he's not a, he's certainly not a jedi he's just barely even aware that he has any force ability so like where did all like all these people happen to just magically you know after surviving order 66 and all these other things they all died off somehow some way off planet off screen in the 15 years before between mandalorian and the force awakens like do you really think that's plausible yeah. okay it, and then like, i'm gonna you know go a big question that. with the sequels where's fucking ahsoka correct because she's not she really a jedi but like, still they're all died they, they all died right <laughs> right and then I'm they survived order the 66 where- but they all had like farming accidents since then <laughs> and uh, so we'll get into the mandalorian when they put grogu on that rock on um tython or whatever the planet is oh. the, the planet. yeah nobody else responded okay. right uh, that's what i'm getting at so where's corn why didn't he respond why did it have to be just luke if if there was time to train him If there's time to train him, you know, and where, you know, usually like if Luke's going to be on a mission to do something, he will reinforce himself with another master, another knight and stuff like that. Right. So they usually Mm -hmm. travel together. And unless, you know, in their circumstances like Luke didn't in the lore, but usually there is um, usually that they reinforce each other just in case something happens. Right. So then, so we're supposed to believe, okay, so if he's apprentice to Luke during the Mandalorian time that he decided not to bring his apprentice or his knight with him to go, you know, um, you know, find Grogu and take off, even though he knows that he'd probably have to, you know, um, fight against any type of Imperial, Imperial remnant during the time to do that, which he does. See how there's like there's so many questions yeah. that this brings up, and their and their excuses. Well, just <laughs> uh, well, there's fifteen. There's a big window. A lot of stories could be told in there, and be like, yes, but they all have like they all have to have this conclusion where they're all gone by the time Force Awakens starts. You don't think that's right. a little silly? Yeah, which destroys the character arc. Yeah, that's and then a, it goes back a to attachment. Silly. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this up here. So yeah. It is. I'll be, I'll be right so True Taker says, except he's okay. True Taker says, except he's already showing signs of it. Yeah, he didn't try. Um, he didn't try to move because of a bad dream, but he also had the same tired old dramatic no attachment rule, and that's the point that we're making here. Didn't mean to turn this into a big argument. Argument, and then Michael basically responds back. Um, I didn't see it as an argument. It's a discussion. There's a lot of Jedi train um, traditions, Force user traditions in the universe. And I've been going through with you guys on Coffee Chat on different Force societies. Um, Jedi basically had one Force tradition, I guess you can say, that we already know and um, that's been established. Um, Skywalker or orthodoxy is the on the way on the way only or is the only way or is the on, on the only way. So he's basically saying Skywalker is making his own now. Um, so, and Luke makes mistakes. We already know that. Um, but Luke didn't recreate the Jedi Order in the new or the original lore. He improved upon it. There were still a lot of things that were very similar between the old and the new. He just made attachments um, different. So where attachments you know, basically, if you just hold on to something that cripples you, um, you could still be married, you could still have kids, that part of attachment was um, something that was um, taking, you know, fixed. Um, So basically, when we see Luke in Mandalorian, he's basically say, you know, basing his theory on the attachment of the old. And so Michael continues, that's established, but others can learn from his mistake. Um, 
So that's what his response is. And then the response to him is this. The sad thing is myself and some others feel that this is a direct slap in the face to all of us who consider Luke as one of our childhood heroes. And then Rebel Jedi um, basically responds with, especially as those mistakes make no sense given his handlings of his father in Return of the Jedi. And that's that he would have already been taught those particular mistakes had been made by the old Jedi Order and be unlikely to repeat. He'd make new ones, not repeat the old ones. And that was the that was the path of Luke. Like when you read Revenge of the Sith, the last chapter, New Jedi Order, I always refer back to this when it comes to Luke's arc um, and, the, and Yoda realizing their mistakes and that the Jedi needs to evolve. The Sith evolved, but the Jedi didn't. He recognizes those mistakes of not allowing the Jedi to evolve. He says Luke and even Leia are the ones that's going to evolve the Jedi and make the New Jedi Order. Um, if you're well-versed with the lore, you know that the order still has some of the stuff that the old order has, but there's a lot of things that was corrected either knowingly or unknowingly. So Michael Sackpole says, who taught Luke about the mistakes made by the old order? Um, we know that Luke cl collected a lot of archives. There's a lot of things that he, um, he was able to find and read and learn. And so there was, like I said, there were some things that he knew there were some things that he didn't, but he did learn. He did have the guidance of Yoda or basically Obi-Wan as a force ghost as well. And uh, Michael says, I get that lots of folks never saw Luke as a character facing challenges. Okay, you guys, did you not see him? I'm going to repeat this again. I get that lots of folks never saw Luke as a character facing challenges. We seen him face a lot of challenges in the EU. There's a lot of mistakes he made. Like even the New Jedi Order, he kind of got passive in the beginning on responding to the Vong. That was a huge mistake on his part, a huge mistake. And so he continues to say, i.e., how does a farm boy learn to become a teacher? By stepping up into the role and making those mistakes and teaching and learning from your masters. I pointed that out in I Jedi. Sometimes characters fail so they can be redeemed later. So let's go and check this out here. So Rebel Jedi says, the guys that were there, Yoda, Obi-Wan, for that matter, their ghosts were still talking to him. In the expanded universe, Luke made new mistakes. He didn't repeat old. And it made no sense for Luke to harp on younglings like the old dangerous bottleneck with one Jedi left. And so he responds with, and I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the um, chat here pretty soon. Michael says, may just be me, but I don't recall a new canon or old where Force Ghosts or anyone else told Luke the history of the Jedi. What their errors were and what pitfalls to avoid, it may be implied, but when I was wor when I'm working with the story, if it, it's not stated, um, absolutely, it's not true. So basically, no, the, the Force Ghosts may not have told him specifically what went wrong. But they trained him and they gave him guidance. They taught him how to learn to use the force. And like Dathomir, when he was on Dathomir in um, the courtship of Princess Leia, he found a ship full of archive training material. That's where he learned and all of that. So, um, so I don't know if you were listening in on this. I well, was. Go ahead. That go statement ahead. pisses me off. May just me, but I don't recall okay. a new canon old where Force Ghost or anyone else told Luke. Oh, they didn't explicitly say it. He's, yeah. he's endorsing there that garbage. Go. So then I will say this as a matter of true, uncontradicted canon as of right now that no Jedi has a butthole because we didn't hear about any of them taking a dump. Right. <laughs> like this idea that you can't imply things in your storytelling that just make logical connections. Like you have to specifically like write it out like you're writing to a fucking three-year-old. Right. For every single thing and you can't use implication and then, oh, it's not true if it's just implied but not specifically stated. What? And you're an author? 
Mm-hmm. You're an author? Then why aren't your books like, why aren't every one of your books 10,000 fucking pages long? Because you have to explicitly state every goddamn thing that happens, otherwise it didn't. Right. That's and such an insanity for, for a writer to say. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right. And so you have like books like this and you have um, that basically describes that Obi-Wan left Luke a journal and it, she shared history of the Jedi of the past in that journal. He also left training material for Luke in that journal. And then on top of that, Yoda, basically there was a ship that was wrecked on Dathomir that had training material because it was a traveling training, I guess you could say ship or facility that has all that information history there. Then in Michael Stackpole's novels, the X-Wings, Corn Horn finds, like he, he gets, he gets captured, he escapes and he finds a, basically a, a room that Palpatine hoarded a lot of Jedi archives that Luke then inherited. So you can't tell me that, you know, Luke didn't learn or know some things. Yeah, there were some things that he may not have known, but there's a lot that he did. Like the, the idea that we can't imply that like, Yoda or or Obi Wan as Force Ghost advised him on things without having a book where it's just this this dry as fuck boring ass book where Yoda just lists off the things that Luke shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. well, these are the mistakes that we have made, and then right. list some mistake number one, and then mm -hmm. go through that mistake number four hundred ninety two, and like mm -hmm. like all the way through. Like we need that. Mm hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Oh, God. And then I'll go back to the Revenge of the Sith novelization, which, you know, um, that was um, that basically, again, that chapter, New Jedi Order, I'll refer back to where, you know, Yoda basically says that the Jedi need to evolve and Luke's going to do it. So basically, they're they're saying, OK, he's going to correct the the stuff that we made mistakes by not allowing the Jedi to evolve. So that in itself tells you that, you know, there's some understanding and there's some things that they're going to allow or let Luke know of without having to go into the whole context of like, oh, by the way, Luke, <laughs> we didn't like attachments, which we know Luke specifically says in the lore. Um, he does say that, you know, he questions like, was attachment a thing or not? So that was something that he learned over the year, but he allowed it without even knowing that it was a mistake. Then later on, he learned that, you know, that was one of the fall because that's what made his father fall. So there was some self-discovery and there was some knowledge that was left for him, but you don't have to specifically say, you know, or write the story, like you said, a boring story of like, P.S. Luke, <laughs> this is what went wrong and you need to change this kind of deal. Yeah, I agree with you, Tuscan <laughs> or Greg. <laughs> Yeah. And let's go ahead. And um, I know everybody's responding to this right now, but it's it's crazy how this like how he's responding here. And True basically says you love you love and no one responded to that. Everybody just left it alone. And then, um, like I said, I'm not going to go into too much of this. You could find the whole conversation on my Twitter. Um, you And I, I don't want you guys to go and harass him or anything like that. You can have a conversation go back and forth respectfully or whatever. I just want to go ahead and just talk about this and discuss that, you know, maybe he doesn't understand what's going on in the lore and all of this stuff. And it's basically what we're learning here. You love and miss your father. You shouldn't be trained despite my exact feelings led to Darth Vader being redeemed. And, and then you know, he was, go ahead. I, I will say this from, from what I'm seeing here, He's mm -hmm. actually, he is having an open discussion. I think yeah. he's way off base and he's wrong, but he's actually doing it in a professional manner. Right. Um, which, which I will absolutely give him some credit for and like, right. absolutely reiterate. Yeah. Don't, don't try and shit bag on him. On no. Like we want more of this kind of interaction from, right. from the folks that are writing Star Wars than the Pablo Hidalgo kind of reactions. Yeah, and the the RJ and all of them that you know basically, and even Star Wars in general, saying if you critique the character or whatever, you're gonna you're yeah, racist you're racist so and all these other things. This this right. is at least an, a, an honest conversation. I think he's wrong, right? But like, I, I, I will give him props for having it. Like he's not being like snotty or condescending or or 
or things yeah. like that. So like I'll give I'll, I'll I absolutely will give him some credit there. You know, good good exactly. for him because it it'd be very easy for him with probably the following that he has to to go the the Hidalgo route or the you know the StarWars.com official Twitter account route and and be uh -huh. a, a be an asshole. And like he, right. at least he's engaging here. So some some yeah. credit. He's wrong, but I, I, like I think he's wrong, but at least yeah. he's doing it in like a somewhat decent manner. Exactly. Sorry. And that's my point. So just to have a that have a respectable conversation. You know, we all learn from these type of conversations, right? And um either, you know, so basically he says, um, he responds with that, well, Corellian Jedi. Well, you know those Corellian Jedi. So basically in the lore, um, Greg, the the Corellia, the Corellians were allowed to, or the Jedi Corellians were allowed to have their own separate like sect of the Jedi order. And so a lot of the Jedi who were Corellian basically got to stay on planet. And so they were kind of like a, a they weren't very separate, but they still were Jedi, but they had their own rules and stuff. So there's that there. And um, so that's why he's saying that the Corellian Jedi. And then I said, Corellian Jedi sect doesn't exist in the new lore. And he goes, so where was that? Um, so where was it ruled out? And Scourge says, of course they could do that in Disney lore, but at the moment it doesn't exist well it's not going to exist because if you have that 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 subsect of jedi on corellia that also goes into question of where were they for the sequel trilogy where were they for the mandalorian where were they for the dark times and the rebellion there you go so that's where that rules out and um let's see here and he responds um it's in the mat. Um, it's okay. He says it's in that neither realm where Corrin exists until Obi Wan Kenobi, and that realm, or digging around it, is where writers like me make our living. So basically, he's looking to come in to write. That's what I got from that. <laughs> Give me a job. Yeah, that's where I got from that. He's looking to write again. And then he says, well, he doesn't exist until he exists. But then you have to fill in the story. Why is he there now? What, where did he how did he come and all that stuff how did he come to be existence to this and and then of course when you write his background story it's not going to be the same that's the thing it's not going to be the same but he's he doesn't care he wants a writing job which maybe he's hurting for money we all are with economy is bullshit right now um you know and all that but i will stand where on my ground here that corn horn if he's brought in and michael gets to write him like zon got got to keep right um Thrawn, it's not going to be the same character. And he can talk his way around it, saying it's possible, but it's not going to be possible whatsoever. There you go. Dangle the keys. Dangle the keys. Dangle those keys. Exactly. So go ahead and tell me what you think about this whole conversation. And then him, like, you, you could tell he wants a writing job. Yeah, that's what I'm getting out of it, is that he just... He's like, hey, let me back in because I looked him up. Um, it doesn't appear that he's published a whole lot in in the last few years. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly not for Star Wars. I think his last credited Star Wars work was Dark Tide Two Rune. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is two thousand two thousand. So the man hasn't yeah. worked in in Star Wars for for twenty two years now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that might be his I mean, he might be retired and happy for, for all we know. Like, I don't know him personally. So, I mean, that could be part of the reason. But maybe he's, yeah, maybe he's just like, hey, you know, I want to I wanna cash in on some of the streaming bucks. Give me right. a script. Yeah. Give me a like, story. I'll write one. Yeah. You know? Or, you know, use my character. Maybe I'll get royalties from it or what have you, you know? <laughs> It'd be like, you know, well, I mean, look at these other guys writing this shit. Like, if they're qualified, then Jesus Christ, I'm like God tier to them. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, compared to the guy who's writing the Kenobi show. Yeah. <laughs> Joby, whatever the hell. <laughs> Joby, one Kenobi. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I bet you're going to be so glad when this is over. <laughs> and then <laughs> it'll it'll just be on to the next thing. I mean. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we're going to do on, you know, obviously the next casual rage we're going to do is we're, we're going to cover the, the final episode, but 
I don't yeah. know what after what after that. I mean, there are some videos Andor. out there. <laughs> well, there's Andor. that and like, <clears throat> and I know EFAP just did it this weekend, but like, I, I think I'm going to want to tackle, you know, we'll see if Rhino agrees with this, but tackle okay. the red letter media's take on the Obi-Wan Kenobi show because I'm just baffled by it. These are the I guys that like cut their teeth and made a name for themselves by like trashing the, the prequel movies and mm -hmm. they're like Kenobi's good. Yeah. I I just I, I'm baffled by that. I think they did a, an episode where it's episodes one through four that they're reviewing so I assume they're going to have another video. Maybe we'll wait till uh -huh. that comes out and we'll EFAP that one. But okay. like their takes, I, I'm just like, I'm stunned. I'm like, oh, wow. You I'm hated the prequels. You hated the prequels, and but you like Kenobi? Yeah. Yeah, Red Letter Media liked it. And the reasons well, they yeah. gave are baffling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there'll be material to cover. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abunas, for the $5 Super Chat Coffee Chat on a Monday. What fourth dimension have I stumbled onto? Well, darling, if you were paying attention, you would know that last Monday, this Monday, I had I rescheduled so I could still have coffee chat. <laughs> so you missed out. Glad I'm watching this live, listening in while I get lunch. Love my EU elitist. So, well, thank you so much for the super chat as well and for the continued support. And with Red Letter Media, I am not surprised. They probably even said that it improved the prequels they're the ones that was responsible for creating or contributing to the so-called backlash um you know it's mainly media and the people who follow media we know people follow media if you haven't been actively paying attention to today's climate even with the pandemic you'll know how much the media has influenced people so just imagine back then when it was little, you know, the, the influence was much smaller. People were still listening to it and still, you know, being followers, the sheeple, when it comes to that. So we're going to go into the rustic um, horn um, lore here and then wrap up. So Tuscan, you'll learn some more information and we'll get into a point here to maybe why Stackpole thinks that this corn horn can fit into the story. But I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here. So if you guys haven't had a chance to vote Get in there and vote real quick. I'm going to read the standings before I end it. And then if you guys vote, then I'll read the final um, standings on this poll. Troy Denning is at 23. Ellen Alston is at 11. Michael Stackpole is at 14. And James Lucino at 51%. So I'm ending the poll right now. And it's going to stay at that standing now. Thank you guys for voting. Maybe I'll do another one with different authors in here. And um, then go back and then put the top four. So I think I have enough to do four polls and then we'll do this top four um, from that. So right now, James Lucino won this one here. And let's get into this lore here. Let me go back to return to the screen. So Rustic Horn basically, it was um, is a Corellian and um, that's Corn Horn's grandfather. Here's Corellia, here's Corn Horn. There's no um, image of Rustic Horn. So I'm just using his descendants or his immediate family figures here. So Rustic Horn was a human male who was the step grandfather of Corn Horn. Corn grew, um, Corn grew up thinking Rustic was his biological grandfather as an adult. Um, he, that he found out Rostick was a friend of his real grandfather's, Nisha Halcyon. And Nisha is the one that's on the cover, the thumbnail of this uh, video here, the live stream. The two, and Nisha basically was a um, Jedi master in the order. The two became partners in uh, um, 32 BBY and last saw each other when Nija was called away in 22 BBY. So basically, ne um, Rostick basically worked for Corsac, which is basically an intelligence sect, um, investigative intelligence sect, and he got partnered up with the Corellian Jedi. During the Clone Wars, Rostick fought in several minor battles near Corellia with the Jedi Master Nija. Nija died near the end of the war, so the Clone Wars. Rostick then married... Um, Married widowed um, Sakara or Sakara Rostic. Um, so, or Horn, or y'all, yeah, I forgot to put that period there. So that makes it matter. Rostic and adopt, um, then adopted her son, Valen, um, father of Corin. He had a long and respected tenure in the Korean Secretary Force. 
um, security force, not secretary. I need my freaking glasses. Um, reaching the rank of director before retiring. He was also a renowned horror um, culturist who was famous for his flower hybrids. And so we're going to get into a little bit more with lore with that. Rasta Korn was reportedly a rebel and Jedi sympathizer during the Jedi purge and the Galactic Civil War. So this is where I think that he thinks, um, uh, Michael Stackpole thinks that maybe Korn could fit in, maybe because of Rostick's background, his um, adopted grandfather, because he was a sympathizer for both the during the Jedi purge and the Galactic Civil War. So we're going to go on to that history. He used his experience in Corsac to assist him, the system in hiding from the Empire. So basically, he hid, he helped hide remaining Jedi um, where they can go into hiding and just disappear. In the original lore, a lot of them just disappeared and gave up on being a Jedi whatsoever and just went into quote unquote normal life. Um, he would store the locations in the um, um, the genetic or he would store the locations and the genetic codes of his flowers. So basically when he did his horticulture, he would, you know, store them in the flower somehow. One occasion he gave an empire, um, empires, Jedi hunters, some such flowers as stock for his garden on a Coruscant. So basically he gave away flowers that had those codes and no one basically, you know, discovered it. Rostek also frequented the raging, um, raging Ronto. When I first was typing this out, I forgot all about that. And like raging Rhino got into my mind during that time, a popular cantina on Corellia. The owner was reputedly a good friend of Rostek and was an infamous rebel sympathizer and, um, whoopsie, wrong one. And um, it was rumored that when the owner of this um, established went into hiding from the empire in 22 uh, ABY, Rostek assisted him and his family in disappearing. So here's some history later on. Rostek was still alive as, um, as of 25 ABY when he kept up a correspondence with Ithorian biologists due to his occupation as a horticulture. In 27 ABY, he arranged for Tahiri Vela to give Know Your Enemy briefing to um, on the Yuzhan Vong to Corsac personnel. So that's a little bit history here. And this is where I see that maybe Stackpole thinks, well, Korn can fit in, maybe because of his um, grandfather's background, what have you. So what do you guys think about that? And um, Tuscan, I know you're muted now, but um, what do you think about that, Greg? Um, just knowing a little bit. What do, what do I think with uh, about the background itself? Yeah, about what? the background because this grandfather, Rostic Horn, was a sympathizer that helped hide or try to hide remaining surviving Jedi and was a sympathizer for the rebellion during the Galactic Civil War. I mean, it, it's fine, I, I guess. Like, again, that makes it very difficult to. Um, to tie him into the the new the new canon, mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, I'm I'm not a huge fan of everybody being related or the grandson or grandchild or great grandchild or everybody else either. So, eh. yeah, yeah. And you know, Disney has a chance, like they said, they want to have creativity, free reign of creativity, to expand on their own lore and create their own stuff. So bringing these characters in just makes it a lot more smaller because now everybody's going to be related somehow, some way, shape, or form. Yes, as you get through the EU, it gets vast and big, especially in the X-Wing novels and such. So we're just looking at one little section of that. But by adding, you know, Corrin Horn in, it doesn't stay true to his character, his development, who he is, why we love him. And then it also changes up his family history as well. Cause Rostic Horn, like I didn't research beforehand if Corsac exists in the new lore. And um, so where does that fall in line with the new lore as well? So that leaves a lot more questions if, um, if anything. Yeah, and hit uh, hit. Uh, why if y'all think Raging Rhino should change his name to Raging Ronto? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, everybody! So we have Jackson who did it. 
so assassin is answering to his own call and then alex <laughs> raging raging rue there we go and thank you again um big rod um raj for the canadian 199 super sticker i don't have the screen in front of me to see it let me see oh yeah i do and it's a thumbs up thank you so much again so any last of thoughts here um greg on what we've discussed here with stackpole and cornhorn eu character being inserted what have you and even with vader do you have any last thoughts uh, yeah it's just it's just more of the same and you know if you're an eu fan and you're like clapping because a familiar name is being brought up mm -hmm. um you, you know you're i don't think you're doing what you think you're doing like applauding this mm -hmm. behavior, aping characters and shortcutting them and ham fisting them into your new bastardized timeline is not flattery. It's it's insulting. It's insulting to right. the or people who originally created them. Um, it's insulting to the fans who, who love them. Um, it's, it's just it's insulting. Mm hmm. You know, and I will add this, you know, like if Michael Stackpole wants to, you know, become a writer in the new lore star wars lore um then maybe start off with a brand new character reinvent a character because this this corn horn you know is is a fascinating character um you know keep him intact where he's at and come up with another fascinating character and um that people may love and know in the new lore and maybe you can add some richness to that if you know you did that michael stackpole instead of trying to reinvent a character you already created yeah, well, I mean, that's a pretty obvious thing too, right? You know, like, hey, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to write in this new lore, just write write something new. Like, you can mm -hmm. have like you can mm -hmm. borrow some character traits, and people maybe will like, oh, this guy kind of acts a lot like Cornhorn, but he's a little different, and, and like that's that's mm -hmm. fine. But like, you're trying to have it both ways and saying like, well, this shit, this old shit, don't count. But like, yay, it's being kind of half reused somewhere else. Like, yeah. I, and again, like, you know, I don't know what his his finances are and, and what his ambitions are. If he, he just wants some recognition or just wants some, you know, maybe do a book. You know what? Come up with a premise for a book and pitch it to, to Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like like it used yeah. to be like a lot of scripts and everything. There was a much more organic process in Hollywood where, you know, somebody would come up with a concept for or an, or an idea. Mm -hmm. And they they'd pitch it, and you know the studio would be like, "That sounds really cool. It, it sounds like it could make us a bunch of money. Let's do it." And now it's just like mm -hmm. it's the studio's top down going, "We need to use this character. Find somebody to write it." And it just seems yeah. like the, like the whole pra the whole the whole thing has just gone upside down. And it, it's mm -hmm. like 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 in music, you know, you got your you got your natural bands that just kind of like, you know, they come together, form a band, do their thing, tour, get popular, sell albums. And, you know, that maybe hopefully for them, make, they make it big and whatever. And then there's these mm -hmm. canned manufactured production boy band kind of things where they just the studio like has a, a several independent artists kind of under contract and they slam them together in a band because you know, oh, this will this he'll be the bad boy. This one will be the the straight lace guy. This guy will be the you know, and each one has their little boy band roles. And it just it's all fake. It's all manufactured, produced mm -hmm. and just not organic. And like that's what's happened to what happened to music with boy bands. Basically, that's what's happening with with Hollywood. It's just it's written upside down. But you know, if I if I'm Stackpole and I want to get back into the Star Wars universe, I'm pitching. Um, and you don't have to write the whole book when you do the pitch. You can just have an outline of the story, yeah. like pitch, pitch a three movie mm -hmm. script, right? Right. Right. Write the, right. write the premise for one. Get back in there. Mm -hmm. But now it has to be so manufactured and and, and so. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, like like I said, they are basically do remakes of everything now, and there's no originality and mm -hmm. stuff. And I was watching, um, you know, um, behind the scenes or whatever from um, my my kids got me a one of the 
um, collectors um, OT DVDs and stuff. And it has behind the scenes, all that special edition stuff. And George basically, and I'm closing with this, George basically was like, you know, he, he talked about how he didn't like the corporate, how movies, how the filming industry was going corporate. And so that's why he was stepping away with it. And eventually he kind of did and started creating his own. And then now he sold it. So that's the irony of this all is that George didn't care for corporate filming. And now his company is in the hands of corporate filming. So there you go. So maybe I'll do a video on that too. You know, that's the irony of this all right here. So thank you guys again for coming in and coming to this um, schedule change coffee chat on a Monday. Next week, it'll resume back Thursday. And of course, watch out for, you know, EU shorts from me and as well as other videos. And then Greg will be on with Raging Rhino for Casual Rage to review the last final episode. At least we think it's final. For um, the OB or for oh, yeah, Kenobi. Or we might get a Reva spinoff or a new Kenobi series. Who knows? Or not, season two. God. Yeah. And do you have any other things that you're coming up with this next week on your channel? No, um, probably next week, Sunday, we'll resume the off the tracks. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually, I'll watch the, the, the current episodes and get caught up on them and be able to talk about them. That, that'll probably be the next stream on my channel will be related to that. Okay. And I always retweet whenever he's coming, whenever he has his live stream and his review uh, with that as well. So stay tuned for that on Twitter as well. And thank you guys again. Thank you chat for coming in and listening to us and, you know, talking about this sort of breaking news this correspondence with Michael Stackpole. Again, you know, be civil with him. He's very respectful, right? You know, and um, having a good conversation about that subject. And thank you again, um, Tim for being here with me and hopping on and I don't know if this is your first coffee chat with me I think so I don't know it's been a while since I had hosted another person other than Stig it, it's it's not Tim's but it's it, it's my first coffee chat yeah did I say Tim again <laughs> you called me Tim again <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I did I'm not really Greg Tuscan Bob <laughs> Yeah, you're Greg, Dusk and Bob, not Tim. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long morning. I've been up early, early this morning. So, yeah. So, thank you again, Greg. I've been for... called far worse things than Tim. Yeah, that's a bad mistake a woman can say to a man sometimes, right? It's calling him a different name. <laughs> well, I mean, timing of that is really important as well. There's, you know, more for the, <laughs> more forgivable times than others. Exactly like this one right here. And Alvin Oss is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and then here, let's see here. And thank you guys again. And usually I respond with you guys and chat with the chat, but I think this turned out to be a, somewhat of a serious matter. And thank you again, Greg, Greg, Tuscan Bob, for being you here with me Bob. as well. <laughs> and I love, and yeah, and you guys enjoy the laughs and my shenanigans, because, you know, especially when I'm tired and all that stuff. And again, may the force be with you guys. And I shall talk to you guys on Twitter. Join my Twitter community as well. Follow us on Twitter and our channels. And thank you again. Another happy landing. <laughs>